Chapter 6, 1902 With his mother's bony hands on his bony shoulders, Alfred is being taken to learn the knowledge of his elders here at this primary school. He is wearing a flat cap which is way too tight, long socks which are way too bright and grey shorts which are way too small. The year is 1902. A matron from New Zealand is becoming the first ever registered nurse as medical standards advance. A French journalist is formulating his plans for the inaugural Tour de France. An American engineer is inventing electronic air conditioning. In Egypt, some workers are building a dam which makes their masters feel groovy. In France, they are filming the first ever science fiction movie. And in Cuba, they are declaring independence after years of petitioning. Whilst the British are in Nigeria fighting a war with a death toll which is starting to soar after weeks of military positioning. But Alfred's gaze is fixed solely on this rocky wall which surrounds this primary school which is housed in this rambling building. This building which sits amidst this concrete space with jumbled windows on its freckled face and a surface of grey gilding. He walks past his flowers which are in bloom and this large classroom which doubles up as this school's main hall. He passes his dirty broom and arrives in this other classroom which is tired, torpid and tall. This room tastes of stair link, smells veggie drink and sounds of stony silence. It contains these slimy slates, wobbly crates and items used for science. Alfred finds this musty classroom which is so little light and so much gloom, so nauseating, nightmarish and new. Such as just being here makes Alfred feel dismayed, afraid, bleak, broody and blue. He sits on the lowest tier of seating in front of that stage amongst the other boys his age who are separated from the females. He sits at his desk which is full of creaky hinges, splinter fringes and musty nails. He shivers somewhat discreetly and smiles somewhat sweetly because he's unused to his school's strange ways. He's unused to the authoritative teacher's cane which he swishes with disdain and is unused to his own teacher's strange gaze. His own teacher tells Alfred that he's a big boy. Don't play with that pencil as if it's a toy and you're expected to behave maturely. So Alfred folds his arms when he's pressed, locks his hands at his teacher's request and sits here rather demurely. He feels shaky, scared and shy so he's too timid to question why or challenge his teacher prematurely. But as Alfred gets older and older, he also gets bolder and bolder and his timidity fades away. He talks to this snotty-nosed scamp who has a hairy ear and the tallest boy in his year with whom he likes to play. And he talks to Bernie, his companion from childhood's journey, who he meets almost every day. Bernie has been nicknamed Sunhead because his hair is bright red and a real beacon of fire, fuel and flame. His shoulders are too wide for his chest, his waist is too wide for his vest and too wide for his gangly frame. Having been put together somewhat loosely, Bernie sweats profusely and stumbles around with wobbly danger. He sways from right to left with all his heft as he searches for steady behaviour. Yet Bernie is not one of those awkward boys who cannot play with toys and cannot play hopscotch. He plays marbles with a plomb, plays conkers all night long and excels at spinning tops. He likes to play cricket using a lamp post for a wicket as he bats with real ease. He likes to swim after school in a public pool and he also likes to climb trees. So Alfred and Bernie play noughts and crosses exchanging wins for losses almost every single break. They play hoops in the dark, tag in the park and splash in their local lake. They run along pebbled beaches and sandy shores through seas which are full of sponges, seaweed and spores and through washed up shipwrecks. They collect Bible cards, cigarette cards, any old cards and any old objects. They even enjoy the same academic subjects. They enjoy swimming lessons dressed in their school's bathing clothes, classes on how to blow one's nose and other vocational projects. But it is military drill which fills Alfred with a real sense of pride and makes him feel great inside as if he himself is almighty, as if he himself is marching into action indifferent to danger, distress and distraction, all in the name of blighty. Drill lessons were introduced to the school curriculum because half the Boer War volunteers were considered to be too feeble to fight, whilst the other half could not impose Britain's might, which had made the government feel nervous. The government had feared that the population was undergoing a process of degeneration, so they listened to one of the National Service League's oration, which also demanded compulsory military service. And so they made Alfred's school hold these drill sessions after an afternoon full of Latin lessons on this field which is bathed in sun. With a drill sergeant who has hair which glimmers with gel 
and a moustache which glimmers as well, holds a loaded gun. He calls for attentions whilst brushing his khaki suit. He calls for left turns whilst stamping his boot. And he calls for forwards whilst slapping his thigh. Alfred obeys for king, community and country, looks up at that gantry and marches on by. My, my d d d daddy was a soldier, he says once his session is finished, with energy which is undiminished and dust in his blinking eye. Did you know him? B b b please tell me about him. Please, please, please. This is a question which Alfred often asks his mother, but she always avoids it in one way or another, which makes Alfred feel overlooked, it makes Alfred feel neglected, rejected and crooked. Was my daddy a real hero? Alfred once tried. You really do love apples, my little soldier? His mother had replied. Did, 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 did my daddy have a big gun? I've made your favourite, my wonderful warrior. Fish and chips. B -b 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 Please tell me, did my daddy beat up lots of baddies? Fish, chips and apples. The white cliffs of Dover. My fearless fighter. B -b 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 Please tell me. Did my daddy protect the weak? B -b -b pretty please, pretty please with a cherry on top. You'll be just like him, Alfred Freeman. Somewhere, somewhere, somehow. You shall, you shall, you shall. Mr. Earl Sergeant is not nearly so evasive, abrasive, caging, cunning or coy. He responds well, which puts Alfred under a spell and fills him with gleeful joy. Your father led a raid on the Boers six years ago, he tells his boy. He was on a mission bold to capture an armoury and make inroads into the gold laden territory which lay beyond. But he was forced hard to retreat, to return to a nearby British province, wasn't he? The son had baked dry the land, water had forgotten to fall, and the natives were all the first. Swarms of locusts had descended like a dark cloud, eaten the natives' food, and starved them a bit. They were hungry, thirsty, and bursting out angry. Whereupon, needing someone to blame, they had blamed the British, those noble settlers who had been civilising the pagan natives and making their country great. The natives had rebelled, killing dead over a hundred British citizens. Their leader had told them they'd be safe. The bullets of the British settlers were turned into water and our cannonballs were turned into eggs. Truth be told, the British settlers had barely any bullets or cannonballs to speak of. It was all but no standing army because it had gone to attack the Boer arsenal. And so the natives were run riot without any resistance strong. Whereupon, your father was called to set the British settlers free and return order to a land which had lost its way. So his troop marched smart across the veld, left, right, left, right, day after day, night after night, didn't they? And before long, every man in your father's navy battalions, imperial yeomanry and sport brigades was all laid up. It was no duff. The drought which had engulfed the British province and engulfed them too. The sun had baked them dry and with no water left, they were soon at first. They were beginning to fall and faint, desperate much for rain. Little pear-shaped stuff, they had a drop of water to drink. Sweet Fanny Adams. Whereupon, discipline in the ranks began to crumble horribly. It was a real scratch force as it was, full of fresh fish who were dog-tired and untrained. A real sorry mix of old army, new army and territorials, all of whom did question your father. Why, they asked him, did you bring us up out of boar country just to kill us and our animals were first? It was real tits-up stuff, a real soup sandwich. Whereupon, they came across a cliff, great and dry, with a boulder of rock at its base. From his travels, your father knew that place well, and he knew what lay behind that boulder. Didn't he? So he called over some of the top brass, who helped him to position a cannon. Whereupon, your father's war brothers began murmuring with hostility. Ussers, skinny berserkers, and brawny gunners, all top vicious behind your father's back, questioning his sanity a bit, and pepping the air with the sound of insults most horrible. Didn't they? But your father paid no attention to their insubordination. He be not agreed with them at all. Together with the other Ruperts, your father loaded a sack of gunpowder into the cannon's mouth, rolled an iron ball down its throat, and stuffed a chemical charge up its nostrils. He lit a match, slow burning, and boom! That cannonball flew quick along the cannon's chamber, whizzed through the air, and hit that boulder hard. That boulder crumbled asunder, didn't it? Thousands of smaller rocks, none bigger than a melon, scattered this way and that. Whereupon, your father slapped his hands together, up and down, in recognition of a job well done. He threw the rubble aside and created a gap of some size. Ah, he said, and he motioned for his men to follow him into that hidden cave. There was a lake magnificent inside, 
wasn't there. The walls were covered in cave water and light glistened in every colour bright, in blurry shades of red, yellow and orange, and an easy mix of greens, indigos and blues. There was enough water fresh for every foot slogger and pile of soldier there. It was clean, tasty and real top drawer stuff. So your father's troops, thirsty, filled their bellies, bottles and beakers, and, fighting fit once more, they returned to the British province. Stepping forth into the breach, they filled every crawl there with good old-fashioned British law and order, banished the walking surgeons to the hills, and left everything as you were. And a jolly good show it was too. Top notch. The jewel sergeant strokes his khaki suit, stamps his polished boot, and begins to excel. He leaves Alfred wide-eyed with amazement, in awe of his statement, which he told like a fairy tale. Alfred feels glorious, gratified and glad, proud of his long-lost dad, who saved his men from the desert's heat. So he says, thank you, for the story, and feels hunky-dory as he hops down this cobblestone street, as he skips down this grubby lane, and jumps through this water truck spraying rain, which dampens this dusty road, as he runs past this flat-capped road sweeper, this honey-selling beekeeper, and this donkey with a heavy load. He runs past this wild dog and this wild mouse, before he rides back here at his house, and sits down by his father's belt. For whilst no words have been said, or documents read, his father's presence is still being felt. Alfred's mother still polishes Alfred's father's army boots, dusts his army suits, and darns his army costume. She still displays his medals on his fireplace, near that portrait of his face, and all around this living room. And all around this man, who is chewing some spam, peaches, pepper, and prune. This man has sideburns which reach his chin, scars which cover his skin, and boots which are covered in scrapes. He eats his chicken legs, boiled eggs, and sticky grapes. Say hello to this man, Alfred Freeman, his mother says as she wipes his sticky drapes. Look at me, he's your new stepfather. He is, he is, he is, he is. He's a carpenter, he's ever so respectable. But Alfred believes that his mother and himself form a complete family who do not need anyone else, and that he is a man of his house. Alfred cooks, cleans and clears, without tempers, tantrums or tears, and without his mother's new spouse. A new pension for war widows was introduced last year, and his mother has a new career, crocheting buttonholes into clothes. So they have food to eat, shoes to cover their feet, and socks to cover their toes. Which means that this man's presence makes Alfred feel rejected and dejected as he starts to fall apart, as he starts to worry about their pension with nervous tension and a broken heart. So Alfred ignores his stepfather whenever he speaks, pinches his cheeks or pats his hairy head. He just stares at his mother, whose clothes clash with each other and are full of garish thread. He isn't replacing your father in heaven, you know, she says with dread. Look at me. Oh, I really don't know what to do with you and all your mystery, Alfred Freeman. You have two fathers now, one up in heaven and one down here on earth. Oh, my terrific trooper, you do, you do, you do. It is respectable. There, that is all. His mother does not give in because she is determined to win and so she starts to whine. Whilst Alfred's stepfather eats some evening meals, jelly deals, lamb, liver and lime. His mother's spine bends her back on each occasion. Her lips produce gentle words of kind persuasion and she keeps her posture humble. Whilst Alfred's stepfather talks honestly, sits modestly and blushes when his stomach starts to rumble. You're not my f f f f father. No thank you. Alfie shouts as his feet begin to stumble. No, I ain't, his stepfather replies as he eats some apple crumble. Torrents of words break through this open gate and leave his stepfather in a dizzy state before he gives Alfred his homemade toys, before he marries Alfred's mother under this church's cover and amiss this background noise, before they move in here together despite the stormy weather and despite those meddlesome boys, whilst Alfred beams with pride with nothing to hide. I'm this peaceful sort of poise.